Smile at someone beside you and tell them you're in the right place for a Monday night. I'll tell you that. The presence of God is here. You can be seated. Now, I have not read these. They throw these up here and I probably should read them, but I trust my team. Lozana from the UK, United Kingdom. Um, we've had no less than 46,000 every night joining us on live stream. Last night, I believe it was 52,000. And that's live streaming. A few months ago, this is someone in the UK, I made a choice to stop going to church because I felt that the church I was attending was not doing what I thought they should be doing. There was a time when the words came to mind, just because I'm not going to church doesn't mean I don't love God. So I settled with that. But one day I decided to watch Pastor Jensen's end time sermon, then I watched Pastor Hagee's sermon, and I just knew something was definitely wrong with me. Then came Evangelist Perry Stone with his week of revival, man, oh man. The service and sermon was all, all of them were directed to me. I was the one hurt by the church and decided not to go back. And I didn't realize that I was taking offense. I praise God that even my husband at 12 a.m. UK time would join in to view the service. Our family made a decision that we didn't want to be Jotham, which he preached a sermon, a powerful sermon Sunday about that. We wanted to get right with God. And we are very grateful for this revival. We're so blessed and we have decided it's time to get back in church. Isn't that wonderful? That was so good, I'm gonna read another one. Daniel from Maryland, I've grown up, this is people online. I've grown up in the church and have always gone to church throughout my life. However, for the past six years, I've not spoken to the Lord over mistakes I made in my life. But when I saw the revival service on Monday, I lifted up a short prayer and said, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. I then heard the Lord speak to me in a way that I've never heard him before. He told me, son, I love you. I'm so glad to hear your voice again. I'm so glad you came back home. <laughs> I felt like the prodigal son watching my heavenly father running towards me. I have this fire in my soul that is with me no matter where I go, and I can't help but share the good news with everyone I see. Can I read one more? I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying these. They're blessing my soul. As a mom, this is someone from Gainesville, Georgia. I guess online in Gainesville. As a mom who struggles daily, we fear that we're not doing enough or the right thing for our children. God spoke through Perry and touched the heart of my 10-year-old son, Bryson. Bryson asked me to walk down to the altar with him, and Bryson prayed his little heart out. Perry then pulled him onto the stage and prayed over him. Bryson was so filled with the Holy Spirit, and when he got back to me, he was... He, he has talked about nothing but baseball. Let me see. Bryson was so filled with the Holy Spirit when he got back to me. He has talked about nothing but baseball, Perry and Jesus. Okay. He's talking. Still a little carnality in there. Amen. But ain't nothing wrong with that. Let me, let me keep reading. Uh, I want to see how this ends. And so he decided to write a letter to Perry, and in that letter he expressed to him that he wants to preach the Word of God like Perry does. As a humbled mom before the Lord, he gave confirmation that even through my children, even though my children have witnessed a lot of hurt, they have also witnessed the power of faith. To God be the glory. Would you welcome... Our evangelist tonight, Pastor Perry Stone. Give him a big warm welcome.
You're going to have to read those earlier. <laughs> I'm crying and, you know, oh my, is that not amazing? Well, let, keep standing for just a moment and let me express my appreciation to you. Oh, thank you. The, the balcony just stood up. There you are. Uh, I just want to express my appreciation to you and I want to be able to look at you. And some of you, I can't see you real well up there, but that how wonderful and how impressive it is from an evangelist perspective to see people hungry for God. And we started Sunday. We've gone all the way through Friday. We've come back Sunday and now we're come, going through Wednesday here to see the appreciation you've gotten. I do understand that there's parking and you park here and you park there. But let me tell you something, that woman with the issue of blood could have been stoned to death by Jairus because it was against the word of God and against the law of the Torah for her to be in a crowd with a hemorrhage. And she pressed in and said she pressed. And so you're pressing in to get here on time and you're pressing in to park and you're pressing in to go. You better believe it. God honors you when you get to this house with his presence. You better believe it. To our online audience, keep watching, keep telling others about it. We know so many, we get so many, I wish I could come, I want to come, I want to fly in. And I've got pastors telling me, you know, we want to, we would love to be there. So pastors, God bless you. You can be seated and I want to get right into the work. Man, I've got one tonight. Y'all better pay attention because listen, this might be the most unique message that I have preached so far. And tomorrow night, now I want you to hear me. The Lord spoke to me sitting down there. I'm preaching on how Satan selects his victims. And I'm going to ask you to do something. I know tomorrow's is, you know, not people go do, do things and kids love candy and all that. But I want you to do your best to get kids and grandkids here because we're going to break the curse off of your kids and grandkids, generational curses. All right. And I'm really serious. I'm not just saying that. I know what this message is. And when you hear it, it how many of you, how many of you, your firstborn child has given you trouble? Raise your hand. You're going to, hey, hey. You know what? I'm going to tell you why tomorrow. I'm going to tell you why. Okay, here we go. The, this, this is tonight, though. <clears throat> the anatomy of a satanic setup. The goal of Satan during a severe trial is to make you lose your faith or give up on your faith. Go to Luke 22, 31 through 32. You've heard me mention this. I think I mentioned this Sunday or one service, but I'm going to, I'm, we're going to dig this out. This is Luke chapter 22, 31 through 32. And I appreciate the men, by the way, all the camera people, the people that uh, go to the screens and do this wonderful work during this meeting. Thank you so much for doing that. So uh, if, you'll, if you'd like to put that up, there we go. The Lord said, Simon, Simon. Everybody say Simon, Simon. Behold, that Greek word means pay attention and look. When you see behold, it means look, pay attention. Satan has desired. The Greek word is to obtain by asking. This literally was like Job. He went before God and said, I want, I want to try that man named Peter. He's desired to have you. Didn't say tempt you or test you at this point. He said he wants you. He wants to have you. That, he wants you, he wants you in his hand that he may sift you with sweet. But I've prayed for thee that, here it is, that thy faith fail not. If, you're, if you have a Bible or you're making a note, take the word F-A-I-L and make it real big on a piece of paper or in your Bible, underline fail. That when, and when you are converted, now this shows he's going to fail, but it's going to come back. Isn't that great? When you're converted, strengthen your brethren. Faith. The definition of faith is complete confidence and trust in the Bible, in God, and a firm belief in God and the authenticity of his word. That's one of many definitions. Everybody in this room at some time or another has been under what we would call an attack. And some of you have been under attacks that were designated by the kingdom of darkness, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly places. But attacks are all about shaking up your faith. Why did God let this happen? There's always a big why in any test that you experience. Attacks about losing your faith, not just shaking your faith, but losing your faith. Why, did God, why didn't God stop this from taking place? Now, what that produces is not just a why, it produces anger toward God. The third is why, why the third part of the attack is about making you continually question why is God doing nothing about it 
or why isn't God telling me how to get out of this? I'm stuck. I'm in a rut. I'm like Goliath for 40 days. The battle is stuck in the valley and nothing's moving. It's just somebody throwing darts into your mind for 40 days the way Goliath's voice did. I want to begin here to talk about a man in the Bible that was a father in Mark chapter 9 whose son had what we would call today epileptic seizures. And when you look at the word of what happened, or what happened to him, and in the Greek, it was called being moonstruck because they noticed that during a full moon back in that day, the tradition was among the Jewish people that someone that had what we would today call epilepsy, that it seemed that when the moon was full, it would happen more frequently. And there is a, doctors debate this, I've looked this up, that the pressure of a full moon is greater during a full moon. That's why you get headaches. I used to get headaches during full moons every month. And uh, I won't tell you what my wife said that was. But anyway, I used to get headaches during full moons, you know. So anyway, they called it, be, uh, they called it being moonstruck, okay? And the word used in the King James, I do not like this word, is behold my son, he is a lunatic. And the Greek word is where we get the word, word lunar from, and that's why they used it in connection to the moon. It wasn't insulting the boy. It was saying he is being impacted by the lunar cycles. This is what we would say today, okay? Now, here's what happened. The Jesus is up on a mountain, and as Jesus is up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, there are nine disciples at the base of the mountain. At the base of the mountain, this father realizes that these men are supposed to be followers of Christ, and they should be able to pray for the boy. After all, Jesus had given them power over demons and to pray for the sick. They already had the authority. As the boy approaches them, he begins to seize or convulse, and the disciples, you can just see them rebuking and rebu rebuking and nine of them jumping and hollering and nothing happens. And then when Jesus comes off the mountain, the father is discouraged. What discourages you is when you pray a prayer of expectation and you see an opposite result after you've been praying. You have a loved one, for example, in the hospital that's sick. And everybody agrees and everybody's excited. Man, I felt faith. Let's go pray. And you pray. And the next day, the doctor says they took a turn for the worse. Your expectation gets dashed. This father's expectation of his boy getting a miracle was dashed when nine disciples could not relieve him from this particular seizing spirit that had a hold of him. So he saw a, a what we call a spiritual failure a prayer that wasn't answered. So when he comes to Jesus, this statement makes sense. Lord, I believe. Then it sounds like a contradiction. Help my unbelief. Now you know you have been there too. You have been there when you have prayed and you believe, but it's not happening. And a spirit of unbelief or mental attitude of unbelief begins to come. And the enemy says, not going to happen. Might happen for Sister Huckabuck. Not going to happen for Brother Shuckashuck. Come on. And so that's what, that's what this unbelief does. And unbelief in the Greek, it has a Greek letter in front of it that negates faith. There is belief but in Greek, when you put the Greek letter in front of the Greek word for faith, it negates faith or unbelief or no belief. So here's this father. And of course, Jesus cast the spirit out. The boy is delivered. The disciples then asked this question. Why could not we cast the spirit out? And Jesus made one statement. Listen to this. Because of your, you know it, unbelief. In other words, something happened to make them doubt while they were praying. Can I tell you something? Demons know if you have faith or not. And I want to explain to you why demon know, demons know if you have faith or not. The true story, in the state of Maryland, a mother asked a preacher that I knew to go pray for her son who was being controlled by evil spirits. And the pastor just showed up and uh, they knocked on the boy's door. The pastor walked in with the mother. The boy's listening to music. He glares at the pastor. The pastor says, I'm going to pray for you, starts praying, and a demon manifests. And the demon looked at the preacher laughing and said, ha, 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 you can't cast me out. You're too full. He tried to approach the prayer without fasting. And so you know what happened to him? Let me tell you what happened to him. The, the, the pastor then tells the mama, said, let me just say this to you. 
I will be back, but don't tell him. He went home and fasted three days, came back to the house. They knocked on the door. Listen to this. And when he opened the door, the demon screamed, Ha! You've been with Jesus. So my point is that the spirit in the boy could tell if the man had faith or didn't have faith. So this is how the spirit was able to stay in the boy's body because it could tell whether there was faith or not in those disciples. Then it said, this kind cometh not out by prayer and fasting. There's been a debate. Is it this kind of unbelief can only come out through prayer and fasting? Or is it this type of spirit can only come out by prayer and fasting? Now, I tend to lean to the fact that spirits have different levels of authority and some of them, uh, the lesser spirits, it's just in the name of Jesus, come out and the person's free. But there are some that are stronger and they form a big, a larger stronghold and it requires a, a, some prayer and fasting, of course, in order to do that. Now, why do we lose faith? Because this message is about a man whose faith was shaken and he was losing his faith because a specific prayer is not answered because we have expected something and the expectations were not met the way we expected or there sometimes is a specific word that's been spoken over us and the opposite is happening. Have you ever noticed that when you receive a real prophetic word from God, next week the warfare breaks out? Yeah, this is the child that God's going to use, and the child's crying. And then all of a sudden, what child comes under attack? The one that got the prophetic word. And sometimes you'll get that word, and you realize that the enemy has targeted the word that's being spoken over you. Now, I want to go to Matthew chapter 16. And gentlemen, it's not necessary to bring the verse up because I want to go through this quickly to get to the real heavy part of this message. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus asked his disciples a question, who do men say that I am? In verse 14, they start saying, well, some say that you're Jeremiah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. So there's all sorts of answers as to whom he was. Then in verse 16, Peter speaks up and says, I'm going to tell you who he is. He is the Christ. The Greek word is Christos. It means the anointed one. He is the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. And notice that Simon Bar. Now that, what in the world is that? Simon Simon Bar is Greek for son of, Simon, son of Jonah. God, uh, blessed are you because the, uh, the, the flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he says this, and upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and what you uh, loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So now, instead of calling him Simon Bar Jonah, he now says, you shall be called Peter. And in Greek, that is a, a Greek word for a small stone. We have a place in Jordan called Petra, and it is a city of rock. It is a city of stone. It's red rose. Some of you saw it in the Indiana Jones movie where you got that big treasury, that beautiful treasury. That's a real place. And so he was saying to this, you have been called Simon, but now I'm going to call you the small stone, the little rock. So he's now, he's, un, he's really encouraging him that he's about to be on a solid foundation. All right, now, I want you to listen to this verse. Why would Satan target him? Because Jesus said, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So if I were Satan, and I heard that, and I can prove that Satan heard it, because two verses later, Jesus tells him he's going to die. Peter rebukes him, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He wasn't calling Peter Satan, but he was rebuking Satan who was giving Peter a negative thought to make Jesus say, you're not going to die. You're not going to suffer. He knew that's why he came. So he said, the enemy is trying to plant a thought here. And he said, you get behind me, Satan. So Satan was there watching at a distance, perhaps listening. So if I'm Satan, what do I think? Well, hey, this guy named Peter has the keys of the kingdom. Now, that's not what Jesus is saying. All believers have authority over the powers of the enemy, not just Simon Peter. But I'm saying, I'm thinking, here's 12 men. This seems to God that is at the forefront. This is the God that's got the prophecy. Here's the binder and the looser. So at that point, I believe the enemy realizes this 
disciple named Peter has some kind of a really heavy major assignment on him. So then Satan begins to target this man called Simon Peter. So let me say this to you. Notice the name change. Now here we're gonna, we're gonna get into some Greek word studies that to me are, are the most fascinating that you can do in one sermon. First of all, his name is Simon. Now, in, in, in Hebrew, it is not Simon, it's Simeon. It is the same Hebrew name as one of the sons of Jacob that was mentioned in the Old Testament. Remember Judah and Levi and Simeon. And the word Simeon in English, if we translate it into Hebrew, means to hear. Now, Pastor, I used to preach this. I preached this all my life that Simon meant shaken like a reed in the wind. I haven't read commentaries on that, but when I went to Hebrew scholars, they said that's really not correct. There's a reason why they said he was shaken like a reed in the wind, but his name means hear or to hear. So his name, Simon, Simeon in Hebrew, would mean you are one that is to listen and you are one that is to hear. Then he changes his name. He no longer calls him Simon, Simon. He says in Luke 8, Luke 9, Luke 12, Luke 18, he calls him Peter. So from that moment on, he changes his name from one who hears to a little rock. A little guy that's going to be a little, one of these, you know, God will give you a name that don't even fit you now, but he doesn't look at you how you are now. He looks at what you're going to be in the future. So he wasn't a rock then, but he was going to be a rock one day. I just want to throw that in there for the sake of the conversation. So here's what's interesting. Now this, oh, I just love this. So stay with me. So here's what happens. So then in Luke 22, the verse we brought up for the text Jesus now sees something's going to happen and warns him. And here's what he says. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired you. Let's stop right there. He'd been calling him Peter from chapter 8 all the way to 22. Now, we're talking about for several years, he's no longer Simon. Sometimes he would say Simon Peter. But most of the time, it's just Peter. So now Jesus changes it and says, Simon, Simon. Now, how many of you know what Jesus did there? That's not a mistranslation in the Bible. He called his name how many times? Did you know that there are several people in the Bible that had their name called twice by God? Eight people. Abraham, Abraham. Jacob, Jacob. Moses, Moses. Samuel, Samuel. Martha, Martha. Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? So I was intrigued as to why God calls people's name twice. So I did a study just on God calling people's names twice in the Bible. Not Martha, but Martha, Martha. Not Abraham, but Abraham, Abraham. Every time God called somebody's name twice, it meant that a huge transition was coming to their life. Is that right, Pastor? Pastor? He was getting their attention to say, now listen, because you're about to go through a huge transition or you're about to see something, my God, that's going to change your life. Martha, Martha was, Martha, why do you doubt? You're about to see me raise him back from the dead. So it's transition or it's something's about to happen that's going to really transform your life spiritually or otherwise. So he says this, he says, Simon, Simon. So he's trying to get his attention. So <laughs> what he's saying is, hey, you, hear, hear, because I'm about to say something. Hear, hear. And here's the thing he did. Ready? <clears throat> Simon heard, but he didn't pay attention. It got quiet there. Because how many wives have told their husband? I need some women to help me out on Monday night. I would say to my wife, I hear you, and she would say, you're not listening. You're hearing, but you're not listening. When they tell you you're not listening, let me translate that to you from Stone's Unauthorized Greek. You ain't paying attention, stupid. Right? 
That's what, that's what you're trying to say when you. <laughs> so Jesus, I want you to get this. Now get the picture. He's about to give this guy a huge warning. And he's saying, listen, listen to me. Satan has desired you because he wants to sift you with sweet. Now that word sift is sweet literally means to tear you apart. What is sifting is sweet? In the time of the temple, when the temple was in Jerusalem in Jesus' day, and they would go get grain, wheat for the bread that was on the table of shoe bread. They'd get wheat and they'd bake 12 loaves every week. They had to sift them with sifters. So they would crush the wheat. Wheat is very hard. They would crush it and they would completely crush it. But then when they crushed it, they put it to, through 10 different sifters. And it literally had to get every speck. There would be little rocks in it. There could be little, just little things in there. And they sifted it till it was completely pure wheat. That then, after it had been sifted, they would put on the uh, altar, then bake it in the oven, make the dough, bake it in the oven, and they would make what was called the table of shoe bread. And they, listen, they sifted it numerous times to get out of it something that was in it that shouldn't be there. I just don't understand why God's letting me go through this. It just might be that there's something in you that he wants out of you. And he's saying, hey, Sister Simon, Sister Simon, Brother Simon, Brother Simon, and you're hearing but you're not paying attention. So he allows something to happen that's uncomfortable because it is not comfortable being sifted. It is not comfortable having to go in that little shake. Oh God, oh God, oh God, I gotta get up in the morning. Oh God, oh God, I gotta go. Oh hell, he's breaking loose. Help me, Jesus. And you're going through that thing, but God is saying there's still some things I can't make you a piece of good bread that people can feed off of me through the word I put in you till I get the little tiny pebbles out of your life. So let me just say this. There is a reason sometimes for trials and tribulations that we go through. So God sifts you. Now listen. God will sift you at times to remove the junk, but Satan sifts you to kill your faith. God sifts you to have you learn something you didn't know, but Satan will sift you to hinder you from getting what you need to know. Preach on, I'm going to. All right. Here is the oddest part of this verse. Everybody ready? Here we go. Here is the weirdest part. Jesus says to him, I'm not, I'm laughing because this is funny. He says, Satan wants you, but I have prayed for you. Then he tells him that your faith won't fail. And when you're converted, whoa, 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 wait a minute. So you're telling me what Satan's going to do. And you're telling me you prayed for me. This is great because if you prayed for me, it means Satan's not going to get to do what he wants to do because you prayed for me. Jesus said, that ain't how it works. <laughs> Satan wants you, and I've prayed for you. Well, hallelujah. And when you're converted, wait a minute, what's this converted deal? I'm already converted. I'm already following you. No, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. Jesus can pray a demon out of somebody. Jesus can pray somebody back from the dead. Jesus can pray open deaf ears. Jesus can open eyes that are blind. Jesus can make a lame person walk. Jesus can heal an issue of blood. Jesus can walk on water. Jesus can turn the water to wine. And all he's got to do is pray. Wait a minute. So Jesus, if you're praying for Peter, why don't you just stop the attack? So I want the answer. So here's what Jesus knew. The strength of Peter's stupidity and his actions and stubbornness exceeds the cap capacity of my prayers for him. I'm going to say it again. So Jesus is saying, devil's coming. I prayed for you, but you're going to fail. And after you fail, you're going to repent. In other words, I could stop the attack, 
But the reason I can't stop the attack, even though I have warned you, is you ain't listening. So I could stop it, but Peter, here's the deal. You're going to do what you want to do. You're going to act like you want to act. So you're going to have to go through this because you're going to do what you want to do and you're going to act like you want to act. So I'm going to have to pray for you that when you convert, you won't lose your faith. Whoa. Pastor, uh, Pastor Edwards has been a pastor and, and you've been a pastor. Mark Castos here, Mark Pastors. And pastors know this. People will want you to counsel them. And basically, I think counseling is great. I've gone through professional counseling. I, if they're good, and if it does you good, I am for it 100%. But I'm going to tell you what the worst thing is, is for you to spend a lot of money to go to a counselor, and they're giving you point A, B, and C, and they're saying, if you'll follow A, do that, and then go to B and go to C. Yeah, 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 I'm going to do it. And you walk out of there dead level knowing you're not going to do one thing they said. I had a pastor friend of mine that they wanted counseling. This is what he said. He said, I will counsel you after you come three months straight to my church and hear me preach. Oh, you're just trying to get me in your church. No, I'm not. Because I happen to believe that if you'll listen to my sermons every Sunday and Wednesday for the next three months, it's going to straighten your life out if you'll believe the word of God and believe what I'm preaching. And you're not going to need anybody telling you what to... I've had people say, I want Brother Stone to pray for me. And I'm fine. I, I love praying with people. But I found out that half the people want me to pray. They don't want me to pray. They want a picture. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm not that great looking. I'm not some stud. I used to be an Italian stallion, but the stallion ran out of the barn, okay? He's not there no more. So uh, <laughs> I had to say that. I'm sorry. But uh, I got some cousins watching up in the mountains of West Virginia that are Italian, okay? But I want to say this to you. I found out that some people want attention. It's not that they're going to listen to what you're going to say. They're going to say, guess what I got to do? Brother, uh, Brother Franklin, we got to talk to him about this problem for 30 minutes. Bet you never did that. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you what you need. You need, a good, uh, you need to go to the bookstore and buy you a really good Bible or go buy a Perry Stone Bible with a commentary in it. That's a better one, okay? It's not a better Bible. It's got good commentary. Commentaries. And you get in that book and you crack the cover and you start reading it and really read it and really believe what it says. And you might be surprised how your life will change if you'll start listening and paying attention to what God told you already. You don't need a new revelation. You don't need somebody knocking you in the head and falling down up and down seven times like dipping in the Jordan River. You need to pay attention to what you're hearing. Come on, somebody. Ooh. Well, Jesus, you could stop the attack, sure could, but I just want you to know, Peter's stubborn. Mm-hmm. Here's the big part, Mark chapter 14, verse 71, the denial. All right. He had said to Jesus, I will not deny you if you die. Woo! Can you see that Pentecostal thing coming up? Oh, I'm going to... You die, I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go with you. I'm going with you. And Jesus just looks at him and says, well, thank you, son. He knows what's going to happen. He's already, he knows by the Spirit. So he's not going to deny him, right? So then, watch this. This Now, we're getting, into, we're getting into the heavy part of this message, right? This, this is heavy. So they sit, he goes to John, who John, who is an apostle who wrote the book of Revelation, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, St. John, was actually, according to church history, a member of the Jewish priesthood before he became a follower of Jesus. And he was related to Caiaphas, the high priest. And that's how John got into the trial the night of Jesus. So he says, Peter, sneak in here with me. So John is a little closer in. Peter's at a distance. Okay, he's a Galilean. And someone's, hey, hey you, you, I recognize you. You, you, you were in the garden. And Peter says, you, you've mistaken me for somebody else. That, that's somebody else. That's not me. What's he afraid of? He's afraid. He just whacked the guy's ear off. A servant of a high priest, which could put him in prison and put a fourth cross on Golgotha. Are you listening? 
because they were appointed by Roman. You had to attack. Now, they didn't, you know, Jews are one thing, but servant of the high priest appointed by Rome meant you attacked Rome, Rome there, and that'll get you killed. And he's scared to death. They're going to arrest him and put him in prison. I don't know him. Somebody comes along and says, you know what? I was with those soldiers out there in the garden. I, that was you that whacked that guy's head. No! What's wrong with you? And then it says this. Now, here we go. This is something that you've read over most of your life. It says, and then he began, to, he cursed and he swore an oath. And he said, I do not know this man. Now, Mark tells you that he swore an oath and writers will tell you he cursed. So which one was it? Was it cursed or swore an oath? It was both. But when I say he cursed, we think it was a foul word or profanity. That is not what he didn't say. Blankety blank, I don't know Jesus. I'm going to give you the Greek. Is everybody ready to go shout yes? Mark's gospel is the first gospel written, and the other gospels copied stories from Mark. I took a theology class. See, I learned something in that, right? And so in that Mark 14, 17, when he swore an oath, the Greek is the Greek word anathema. Now that doesn't mean nothing to you till you go to 1 Corinthians 16, 22, and it talks about that if any man uh, says that no Christ doesn't, doesn't believe Christ, let him be anathema. And that is a very strong word. Now listen to what I'm about to tell you. Look, if any man love not Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. In Greek, in the New Testament, when Peter swore an oath, he did an anathema according to Mark's gospel. That changes the whole understanding of Peter denying the Lord. Anybody want to go there? Shout yes. yes. Anathema, in his case, by denying the Lord, he put a self-curse on him. This anathema is called the curse of excommunication. You will curse yourself from the house of Israel. You curse yourself from the synagogue. And also, he cursed himself and excommunicated himself from the other 11 disciples. In the New Testament era, first century, if a bishop put anathema in the church on a person, it carried the idea of everlasting destruction. So if the bishop called someone out and someone was really messed up, causing trouble in the church with sin, it was spread all over the place, he said, today I place anathema on you in the name of the Lord. They carried them out and they were eternally doomed. They were placed under, it was a curse. So when it said he cursed and swore, Mark said, Peter put an anathema upon himself. So here's what he said. If I know this man, this is what he was saying now. If I know this man, Jesus, let me be banished from the presence of God forever. And then you remember the story of the rooster crowed third time. And he went, huh, huh. And he started running and he wept bitterly because let me tell you about an we call it anathema. Anathema is probably the correct pronunciation. So it, either way, we say it both ways. But let me tell you what was serious about this. The only person that can get you out from under that curse is the head of the synagogue or a head rabbi. You cannot get yourself out from under that once you speak it. And his head teacher was about to be crucified. And they called Jesus rabbi. So his rabbi that he sat under for three and a half years is the only person that has the authority to reverse the self-curse he puts on himself. And that's why Jesus said, I pray that your faith will not fail. Mm. The word fail in Greek, I told you a minute ago, when you write this verse down, write the word fail down, is the Greek word eklepo, eklepo. It's where we get the English word eclipse from. 
I pray that your faith will not eclepo. We get the word eclipse because what is an eclipse? An eclipse is the absence of light where light suddenly disappears and suddenly in a moment's time, darkness has come. When Jesus used the word fail and the Greek word is eklepo, he was saying, Peter, I pray that your faith will not be in a permanent eclipse. Because you have walked in the light, Peter, but darkness is going to come over you when you do this. When you fail, darkness will come and the light will be hid. He did not want them to know he knew Jesus. He's hiding the light. He did not want them to know he was in the garden. He's hiding the light. He did not want them to know he was a disciple. He's hiding the light. So his faith has gone into a total and complete eclipse or a total and complete absence of the light. But God says to him, but Peter, when you are converted. And that word means to return again to the light. When you return again to the light you've known and you get the darkness, you, boy, I feel his presence here for somebody, will strengthen the brethren now watch what happens. Jesus raises from the dead. And Peter and John, if you read the Bible, John is younger. And John outruns Peter to the tomb. Remember, there's two of them. Read the Bible. John outruns him. But John waits outside for Peter, the older man, to step in and see that the tomb is empty. And when Jesus is raised from the dead, what does he tell, the, what does he tell Mary? He said, you go tell my disciples and Peter. <laughs> that I'll, I'll be seeing him. And they end up in Galilee, of all places. And they end up in Galilee because that's where Peter's fishing business was. Not Jerusalem. And when Jesus shows up, Peter is fishing. You know why? He thinks he's blown it. He's gone back to his fishing business. He thinks, well, I've messed up. I can't be a follower anymore. I was, I was with him three and a half years. I got stories to tell, man. I can tell you what God did, but ministry-wise, huh, I'm cooked, man, because I put something on me. I can't, I can't get off. I'm feeling, some, I'm feeling somebody's heart right now. That's why I'm crying. I'm not crying for Peter. I'm crying for somebody here that has had this happen to you. I'm too far gone. I've done too much. I'm in church, but I don't think I'll ever get to where I was. I'm in church, but when I was a kid, man, like a teenager, I was on fire, but man, I haven't had the fire in a long time. I, I just can't get there. I'm sorry. I just, I'm just running my business and I'm just working my job and I'm working five hours a week. And so, and he's in the boat and he looks at the shore and he realizes Jesus is there. And here's what it says. He was naked and jumped in the water. Now, when you're, when you're that backslid, <laughs> clothes don't matter. Clothes don't matter. <laughs> and I understand they were fishing. There's a, there's a reason why. They're not out there all naked jumping around the boat having something going on. Okay. But, but he, what happened is, you know, Adam and Eve were naked, not ashamed. He was naked and ashamed. You know, Je oh, my Lord Jesus is here. He jumps in the water, but then he ends up on the shore. Now, watch what happens. So they catch fish. They catch 153 fish. There's a prophetic state. There's a prophetic reason why it's 153. That would sidetrack me. We're not going there. But they sit down to eat. And John says this, that Jesus looks at Peter and says, Hey, Peter, Simon, lovest thou me? more than these. See, he's saying, here, I'm going to tell you something. Yes, Lord, I love you. 
Now, it's interesting that several times Jesus uses the word agape or agape, which is the love that you have toward God and God has for you, right? But then Jesus changes a word there in Greek and says, do you phileo me? And that means really fond emotional attachment for. What he was saying is, now, Peter, it's very easy for you to say in front of these guys, I love you, but I want to know, what do you really feel about me? And ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. He asked him once, do you love me? Yes. He asked him twice, do you love me? Yes. He asked him a third time, do you love me? Yes. And then he said, now go feed my sheep. Here's the key. The reason Jesus said it to him three times is he had denied him three times. And don't miss it now. This is, this is the ex, uh, this is the former disciple that was on fire, that got in the fire, that needed his head rabbi <laughs> to restore him in front of those other men. Because they were going to the rest of their life look at him. If he got back in the ministry and said, who do you think you are preaching on Pentecost? I'm not the guy that denied him, dude. You are. And it would hang on him the rest of his life. If Jesus had not done this, sure, he could have believed and got back in the ministry. And sure, he could have preached on Pentecost. But I'm telling you, it would have not been the same. Because in Israel, it is the head of the synagogue, or it would be the head of the church or be the head rabbi that has to take the anathema, the curse off the person. And when Jesus did it three times, he was saying, and look, they knew what he was doing. Every, every one of those other 10 disciples knew what he was doing. He was saying, when Peter said, yes, I love you intimately, he was saying to those men, now, don't you ever again bring up his failure. <laughs> don't you ever again remind him of this curse. Because today, I have taken off of him the curse he put on himself. You who are here, oh, Jesus. I want to tell you something, and I'm, I'm just about done here, but listen to me. In our lifetime, Pastor Jensen and I especially, we've had hundreds of pastor friends, and we have had men that we've admired. You have too, and you looked up to, and they fail, and some failed miserably. I was with another Pastor Franklin um, in North Carolina who is a counselor and has a great church. And we were talking one day and he says, I'm going to tell you the amazing thing about God. And we were talking about this great man and how he, he had supported his crusades and his meetings. And when the failure happened, it was known all over the world. And he said, let me tell you about God. He said, when God called him to preach, he all, a long time ago when God called him to preach, he already factored in his weakness and his failure and still called him. <laughs> Got to understand something. God doesn't save you because you're perfect. If you were perfect, you don't even need redemption. If you could save yourself, you don't need to be in church tonight. But do you understand that when you get right with God and when you repent and if you look warm and you're backslid, God already knows that there's traps set for you. He already knows that there's things that will happen in your life. And yet 
he still puts you in a place with him after he's already factored in they're weak at times. They struggle at times. What does that tell you about God? It tells you you have a high priest who understands your infirmities. I feel the presence of the Lord in this place tonight. And I want to tell you this story. It's a true story that happened. Many years ago, I was preaching in a church in the state of Missouri, and it was a really precious young couple. They were young. They were in their 30s. I mean, they look like Ken and Barbie, and I'm not kidding. You put them together, they look like the Ken and Barbie of the Christian world. The church had almost nobody there when they went. They began to grow, and they grew to a large church, and something happened. And I won't go into detail, but his wife had an affair on him and divorced him and left him. Now, back in the day, he could have survived it because he didn't do anything. He could have survived that, but, uh, I mean, today he could have survived it. But back in the day, uh, churches really looked down on that. And so somebody wanted his church, and they asked him to step down, which they should. They didn't have to do that. I'm just being honest with you. And it hurt him so bad that he'd worked so hard for years and built this church and they asked him to step down. He not only quit the ministry, he quit serving God. He got very, very bitter, very upset. And he went, and listen to the story, he went years and years of never stepping foot into a congregation, never going to church again. I was in Pulaski, Virginia preaching. And somehow they got a hold of me and said, so-and-so, has called you from Roanoke, Virginia. I said, oh my goodness. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know he, is he, is he from there? Yeah, he works a job there. Not heard from him in years. And I knew the story that he wasn't in ministry. I knew the story that he was bitter and I knew he was hurt. And he'd been that way for years. So he took a secular job and quit everything. Wouldn't talk about God. <laughs> and I get him. I get him on the phone at the church. I called his name. I said, man, how are you? What are you doing? I preached for him. I, we were friends. He was from Virginia originally. He said, well, I got to tell you something. He starts crying like crazy. He said, I was sitting in my office. And I had a box of stuff from, from Missouri where we pastored. And I just, I, I hadn't gone through it. It was just a box of junk, I thought. And I, I found a tape of yours. And I thought, you know, let me listen to Perry preach. I always like Perry. He says this to me. And he puts it in the recorder, and it's a story of Samson's comeback. It's a story of a great, I call it the greatest comeback in the Bible. When I got to the end of he shook himself and brought the temple of the enemy down and killed more enemies at the end, the Lord spoke to him for the first time in years and said these words, you can have it all back. And he showed up in the revival, ran down to the altar, and got it all back. All you have to have is a word from God to get back to where you need to be. All you have to have is one quickening of the Holy Spirit to put you in place in the kingdom of God again. Everybody put your hands together in this house and praise the name of the Lord. Thank you. I want you to be seated. We have to do this. These altars have been so packed, we haven't even been able to pray for people. And I'm hoping tonight that we'll be able to pray with people right here in the front. Just right here. Listen to me. Who is here? I would not preach this to preach it. There is someone here who this story is an image of your life. It's an image of where you've been. It's an image of what you've been through. And I am asking you 
men and women and young people. That you've been through something and you know maybe there was a day that you were closer to his presence and maybe there was a day when you just loved being with him and around him, but there's a block. You've said things out of your mouth. Sometimes you've been angry at God and even said things to him. And you've had things happen to you and you know you feel like a failure. You feel like you failed. And you want back. But you're here. But you're wanting here. And the devil's told you you'll never be. In the old story, the bird with the broken wing will never fly twice as high again. And you feel that way. I'll never be back to where I used to be. And maybe you've never been there yet. Maybe you've never got to that place in God and you just showed up on a Monday night to hear what this preacher had to say. Well, God had a word for you. Quit living in your failure. Quit living in your disobedience. Quit living in the things that's driving you mentally, emotionally, and spiritually crazy. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to do what I've done every night. That's the way the Lord spoke to me. I'm going to say one, two, three. And everybody who wants prayer for any situation after you've heard this word and you feel like there's something in it for you, you get down here and line up and we're going to start praying. I want the prayer team to come up here first real quick, just as fast as you can because the anointing is working very heavy. And just line up. We're going to start praying for these people, and I'm hoping I can get down there and pray. Literally, we have a pastor, and I can't, have not even been able to get to the front and pray with anybody because of the, the people that have come. And I hope, I hope you come, and I hope you do not allow the enemy to defeat you in any way. Even if you've been worshiping, even if you've been here during the whole meeting, but you say, uh-oh, there's something in that for me. Then on the count of three, you get down here. Are you ready? Are you ready? Everybody, start moving. One two, three, in Jesus' name. In G line up all the way across the front. This is your, you came tonight, you didn't know God had you marked for this service. You didn't know the Lord had you marked for what he wanted to do for you. <laughs> Pastor, I see people breaking down and weeping already. The Spirit of God's touching them already before they even get here. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Some of you, this is your first service. God brought you on a Monday night. God brought you on a Monday night to hear this word just for you. Just for you. Everybody raise your hands. I want to pray a prayer with you. And it's not over when I'm through praying. When I'm through praying, I want you to talk to God on your own while we start praying with men and women. Say this out loud. Dear Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit touching my heart. God, I'm asking you, take my failure. Take my disobedience. Take any sin I have. Wash it in the blood of Jesus right now. God, I want to be transformed by the renewing of my heart, by the renewing of my mind. And I want, to, I want you to help me, Lord, to get over everything that has brought the darkness in and remove it in Jesus' name and bring the light into my life and change me tonight in the name of Jesus. Everybody stand to your feet and stretch your hands toward this altar. Point toward these people in the aisles right now. And all of you that have come to the altar, pray on your own and open up your mouth and pray more and worship and ask Jesus to do the work in your life. Come on. You're not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. There's so much more to the story. In the name of Jesus, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. 
I've not heard this this entire meeting till tonight. There's several people that have a suicidal spirit that has been on them. And, and I'm going to tell you what the Lord just told me. He said they have enough knowledge of me that they, that they would take their life, but they don't know where they'd go. And the only restraint that's kept them from taking their life is would I die lost? And I feel like that we need to pray that spirit off of you. Okay, now, this is nothing to be, listen, I know people, they'll come up after a service and say, well, that was me, but I didn't want to raise my hand. Please don't do that, because when the water's troubled, us, when the anointing is working. But 
Some of you, some of you are not even up here. You're out here. But I'm going to ask you if you feel like it, not feel like you know that you just have had thoughts of like, why not take your life? Nobody really cares anyway. Ain't nobody going to miss you. And uh, several of you, it's a busted relationship, and you're on such a downer right now because of some. And it, one of them's a well, so, well, somebody, it's a young one of them's a young person that you had a really bad busted relationship, and you feel like you're just going down a slide, and you just can't. You're it, it, you're like you're dead on the inside. All right, raise your hand real high right now if you've been battling a, that kind of a. Here's a precious one here. Here's a precious one here. Let me see your hand. I've got to have it real high where we can see it. There's right there. See that young man? Okay, if you see someone with their hands raised, we don't normally do this. I'm very careful who lays hands on people. But if you see someone, there, we can't get to them, but you can. If you're full of the Holy Spirit and you see somebody, go to them right now. This is, this is a, this, the Lord tells me it's a spirit of some kind. It's not just a bad time you're going through, but it's, it's, there's a, there's something that's happened where it's, and it's going to go. That's the main thing. It's going to go. God's going to give you really, gather around them right now. Gather around them right now. We're going to break this by the power of God. Now, Father God, right now they're laying hands. God, right now they're laying hands on those that have this, this thought, this, this thought. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Spirit of confusion that's come on them. And I'm going to call it what I think it is, God. I think it's a spirit of hopelessness. I rebuke the spirit of hopelessness by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. I rebuke the suicidal thoughts by the power of the blood. Oh the Lord Jesus Christ and we command the thoughts to change and to be altered we command in Jesus name for the pressure that's on their heart and on their mind to be lifted in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus I said in the name of Jesus give it up right now let it go let it go there you go that little lady the power of God just hit her right there you're getting it honey there we get Jesus, lose her. There you go, there you go, there you go. Right over here, I command you, little young lady, to be free. Be loose by the blood of Jesus. That man right there, that young man in the back, I charge you by the blood of Jesus. Be free. Your mind will be free. You will sleep tonight without any drugs whatsoever in your system. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, pray for him. Everybody, everybody raise your hand. I command it not, I, I forbid it, I forbid it to return. Jesus, Jesus saw someone delivered one time and he said he forbid it to return. We forbid it to come back in Jesus' name. By the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, we forbid it to come back. I take charge and authority over the spirits of oppression and depression and the hopelessness that are, that are riding on people's spirit and on their mind. You let them go. Hey, 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 you let them go in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Son of the living God, by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of God's Word, we speak it over you right now that you'll have freedom, you will have peace. Oh, 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 oh. talk to a young girl the Holy Ghost said I have a word of knowledge for you the Lord said don't you grieve over some boy that left you he wasn't for you anyway God's got somebody better so don't grieve over what don't grieve over who don't grieve over what God took out of your life God took somebody out of your life to help rescue you hey it's all right praise God it's okay because God loves you enough to protect you Oh, praise the Lord. Let's lift our hands. There's an anointing of God that's ministering to people. There's an, I, my God, my Father, my Father. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Receive. I, come, I, 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 I speak to you to receive your deliverance from the spirit of hopelessness, and I speak the spirit of peace over your mind. This is for the people that had your hands raised just now. And Lord, when they go home, everything that's in that house that apartment, that trailer, wherever they live, 
that should not be in the atmosphere, you drive it out before they ever walk in that place. You send an angel of God to drive it out that's causing the root of this torment, that's causing this pressure, drive it out, let their whole atmosphere be free. Send the angels out all over Gainesville toward Atlanta. Woo! This direction over here, that direction, north, south, east, and west, north, south, east, and west. Send them, Heavenly Father, to set people free. To set, oh. 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 Pastor, come on up here. The Spirit of God's moving on people right now. Let's lift our hands again. It's, it's still early. That clock says 8.30. I guess... I guess it might be. I don't know what time it is. I don't care. I'm just telling you, we're in the we're in the presence of God. So so don't don't be in a rush. Don't be in a rush. Just just linger in His presence. I don't know what God's going to do this week, but God did something for a lot of people tonight. He really did. I'm serious. This is not just a this is not just an altar call. God did. God brought you here on a Monday when you could have stayed home to get an impartation in the atmosphere of this revival. Let's all raise our hands and bless Him. Pray in the Holy Ghost for just a few minutes. Pray in the Spirit for just a few minutes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. lift your hands toward heaven this is an old old song that we used to sing my daddy used to sing it in his altar calls sometimes and it would move me to my core it says Jesus use me and oh Lord don't refuse me for surely that's a work that even I could do and even though Lord, help my will to crumble, though the cost be great, though the cost be great, I'll work for you. I want everybody who wants God to use you, to restore you, sing, oh, Jesus, you. Presence of the Lord that's in this place. Just lift your hands one more time. We have no agenda. We have no purpose to be here. We don't have nothing else to do. We're not taking an offering. You can give when you leave. There are giving stations out there. We don't care. That's not what this is about. It's about Jesus. Lift him high. Lift him high. Worship him. And, and sometimes it's not screaming out. Sometimes it's just lifting your hands.
turning your heart toward heaven and saying, I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. I mean it. I surrender. Surely there's a work I can do. That I can do. And even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Though the cost be great. close with this I promise he's the lily of the valley the bright and morning star he's the fairest star ten thousand to my soul oh of all, but most of all, He is my coming King. Throw your hands up and sing in church. Oh, Listen now, listen. Though the cost be great, I'll work for you. How many of you received this powerful, powerful, powerful word from the Lord tonight? Oh, to God be the glory.